Welcome back, uh, lecture 33 today, uh, this is the second last lecture of this week on gallium nitrate RF devices. If you recall in the last lecture we talked about commercial, uh, commercially available RF GAN power hemps, uh, we discussed the data sheet uh, briefly and we also talked about things like via hold and how, via hold and how uh, people make the air bridge for instance and how we showed images of X band, you know C band etc. Uh, uh, commercial devices. So today we are going to talk about uh, how the people actually assemble them and make a power amplifier for instance but very qualitatively and uh, and then we will move to what are the new things or what are the uh, next upcoming frontiers for GAN RF electronics other than what is being done already or what has been done already okay. So over to the whiteboard here. So uh, in the last this was the last image that we had discussed about how people to show an image of how people have wire bonded an RF gallium nitrate RF hemmed in a package in an industry package okay. Uh, so, going ahead what we um, this is again a package, but your device need not always be in a package form, it could be in a bare die form or it could be a package form, it could be either matched or it could be either unmatched to 50 ohm line. So, in this image uh, you can see that uh, this is your GAN device which is here in this case is most likely looks like a package device. This is again from a book or an internet okay, this looks like uh, it is a package device. This is the, the substrate you know the black entire square thing that you see here it is the substrate on which you are you are essentially fabricating or assembling things to make a power amplifier. It is called a hybrid power amplifier or a MIC microwave integrated circuit. It is not monolithic because you have combined discrete components to actually uh, or you are combining different things to actually make the amplifier. So this is your the it could be a bare die or it could be a package but it is attached to uh, a material below and there could be a heat there would be a heat sink below you know this is probably a heat sink typically it is a copper copper moly heat sink okay metal alloy there will be heat sink on which you put the entire thing and this is your board. So you see uh, this is your output impedance network or uh, impedance matching you are matching the output impedance here okay if this is if assuming that this is your output this is your RF output actually and this is your RF input okay. So bringing the RF signal here you connect and, and you are bringing the taking the RF signal out here. These connectors are called SMA connectors okay. These SMA connectors are connected to this board and then they have the feed line attached to them. So, which the RF signal is coming here. This is the output matching that you are implementing using transmission line. These are all transmission line by the way. These are all transmission line. This metallic transmission lines the width and the dimension of this metallic transmission line will basically make them behaves as a capacitor or as an inductor of certain uh, value capacitor or inductor of certain value the width the line the band the angle of this transmission line okay we will see that in microwave engineering basics they make the transmission line behave like a capacitor or an inductor or a resistor okay of a certain value that you desire. So the design is that very important so trans using transmission line this is your matching circuit so that output you see a 50 ohm similarly this is your input matching you are doing an input matching here to 50 ohm and that input matching this is the input matching network that you have implemented using a transmission line. But instead of transmission line you could also use lumped components which what it means is lumped components is that this could be for instance some kind of uh, resistor, inductor, capacitor in parallel series that is what it is representing here. But instead of that you can buy actually a lumped a discrete resistor or inductor or capacitor from the market a street, street shop okay radio shack. I can you can use them and you can make the circuit with the lumped elements also provided it is lower frequency you know typically not at X band or so lower than that. But even some people do it at even at X band but for 1 to 2 few gigahertz you can do that. But if you are not millimeter wave 25 gigahertz 40 gigahertz then transmission line is mandatory. Typically DC bias is provided from the top okay. So this could be your DC bias okay. Uh, DC bias is provided from the top there has to be a DC bias on the gate there has to be a DC bias on the drain though this is most likely DC bias on the drain, this is most likely DC bias on the gate and this is output matching, this is input matching there would be a stability network also on me maybe which of this I cannot tell you exactly here but there will be a stability uh, circuit also if you are if you're high power device with high gain you have a stability issue okay. So this is how a hybrid power amplifier is done of course there can be this is a discrete die you can have power combining also you can have multiple dies and you can combine them power you can have different power combiners available, power dividers, power splitters where you can split the power, you can combine the power, there are couplers, there are so many microwave uh, components that you can actually either fabricate on this uh, board 
uh, using transmission line or you can buy also some of the things but most of this is usually used in MMIC where I will show you an image later on where everything is done in a monolithic on a single chip ok. So, if I if I blow up this whatever I have shown you here if I blow this up this is how it looks like this is the mechanical housing but that will <coughs> that will be on a heat sink ok ok it will be on a heat sink and this is your SMA connector as I told you this is SMA connector and screws this is the output side for instance this is the input side SMA connector and you will feed them you know the input line this is the feed output line you are fabricating this on a board and this board is a PCB printed circuit board board people do people typically use something called Roger substrate which is RF you know is good for RF people use the Roger substrate as a PCB uh, and on which they will print these lines you know transmission lines this these different lines are transmission lines you will print them you may use lumped components like capacitor inductor you can use them you can use the transistor as a bare die or a package die which will bond it in, a, in a here and then you will attach everything here ok. So, this is a mechanical housing you have to screw it and hold this board on that and then there has to be a heat sink below it to manage the heat when it is very high ok. So, this is how a power amplifier is uh, made using a uh, discrete die that you can a package die or a bare die ok. Now, this is the, uh, just a hybrid ok, but you can make everything monolithic. When I say everything monolithic it means uh, everything is fabricated on the same die at in the inside the clean room you fabricate you do not do all this uh, street shop components and you do not assemble you do not make this transmission line separately uh, in a printed circuit board you have everything on a die. So on a gallium nitrate die for instance or a gallium arsenate die you fabricate everything and so your resistors, capacitors, inductors, spiral inductors for instance ok, transformers everything can be done on the in, in the monolithic platform. This is a very uh, simple schematic of how a monolithic uh, circuit will look like MMIC this is all fabricated on the same single die. So, you can see this is spiral this is spiral inductor actually you know it is spiraling 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 this is like inductor one metal goes on top of the other metal goes on the top of the other metal wi winding metal winding and you can see that they are separated by a dielectric typically silicon nitrate for instance they have to be very thoroughly designed characterized and model you cannot arbitrarily have three number of turns or four number of turns here the thickness of the line the width of the line the height of the, uh, the, the thickness of the dielectric on which it sits the number of turns everything matters in terms of the impedance in terms of the the inductance that you can get in terms of how much nano energy you are getting. So, this has to be thoroughly done in ADS this is such a for example ADS there is also other softwares using those software simulator simulation tool you have to design this you need to know the dielectric constant of the dielectric that you are using for instance ok and this has to be this has to be characterized thoroughly ok you have to characterize at different frequencies and model also only then you can actually get this uh, devices or this spiral inductors this is for instance capacitor MIM stands for metal insulator metal. So, you have metal on top of that you will have a, a thick silicon nitride the thickness of the silicon nitride will dictate the capacitance and there is a top metal again. So, metal insulator metal the thickness of the silicon nitride that you are putting as well as the area of this pad will decide the capacitance of course. So, you have a metal this is a this is a via hole by the way you have to short this ground no that is a MMM capacitor this is everything is fabricated on the on the same die ok these are gate fingers you can see this is drain terminal this is gate this is active device hem multi finger hemmed right this is the source terminal that is grounded and there is air bridge here this air bridge here correct there is inside in and this is this is probably the gate and you have a resistor this most likely is a stability resistor you know stability network you are introducing an additional resistor to make sure your gain is reduced so that your stability is improved ok. And this is a you see it is input matched to 50 ohm. So, your input is 50 ohm matched it is a 5 50 ohm mic micro strip line that you are bringing the signal in everything this is just a simplistic one, but there will be power combiner power splitter Wilkinson power divider. So, many things can be done on the same die you have to fabricate them you have to design thoroughly model and characterize ok. Spir spiral inductor is one form of inductor there could be very other forms of inductors also there could be other forms of capacitor interdigitated capacitors for instance ok. MMIC design is a whole new uh, course on its own MMIC design fundamentals can be a separate course on its own because it is very involved, but this is on a single die what is the advantage it makes things very compact as opposed to a hybrid power amplifier and MMIC will be much more compact ok and especially at very high frequencies millimeter wave V band W band etc. MMICs are critical because wire bonding or those discrete elements and having a board like this becomes very challenging at millimeter wave frequencies you know 40 50 gigahertz you cannot have the discrete components put in because your wavelength of the RF signal will be smaller than the discrete component sizes. So, you have to have transmission lines completely and so MMICs are the way to go at very high frequencies you know when you need power amplifiers ok. So, this is about that. 
Now, we, we discussed primarily about gallium nitride from the point of view of power amplifier. We talked about breakdown of course, current dispersion, current collapse, all kinds of things. But what is, what are the next things for gallium nitride RF electronics or RF devices? So, based on my understanding, I am going to discuss a few things briefly, which uh, I personally believe based on my understanding of the gallium nitride RF world are being actively pursued because those hold a lot of promise for the next generation gallium nitride RF electronics. So, one of them is that uh, there is a lot of uh, attraction, uh, attraction or interest in low power gallium nitride RF power amplifiers or even low noise amplifiers which have to be enhancement mode and these are for handheld electronics such as smartphone, uh, some kind of handheld gadgets you know could be drones for instance, uh, iPads, ThinkPads, etc., which you are battery operated which are low power. Typically gallium nitride is high power, you have to bias it at 28 volt or maybe 58 volt and so the knee voltage does not matter you know because your breakdown will be 60, 70 volt etc or 100 volt. But here you are talking about handheld electronics, so the battery will supply about 3.5 volt close to that 3 volt, 3.3 whatever which means your RF power amplifier has to give power at 3.5 volt. So, if you look at ID versus VD, this is ID versus VD output characteristics, this knee voltage has to be lower than 1 volt because at 3.5 volt this is the area where you can swing actually the output voltage. So, the knee voltage has to be less than 1 volt, it has to be as low as possible, if it is 0.5 volt even better, but your new voltage cannot be 2 or 3 volt then you do not have any margin on the drain bias. Okay. So, extremely low knee voltage was a problem in gallium nitride hemp, but people have been achieving it now. So, you need to get RF output power at a low voltage of 3.5 volt approximately, it means your knee voltage has to be really less than 1 volt. Your excess resistance as your contact parasitic resistance has to be have to be ultra low, so that you do not drop extra voltage only then you can get this low new voltage. And you need an normally off or an enhancement mode device, because the battery will give you single polarity supply, it will not give you negative voltage. So, in a handset you would preferably want an enhancement mode device. So, there have been many reports on enhancement mode RF in general, but enhancement mode RF for low power more reports are coming up in the last one or two years. And this is a representative paper from uh, Intel I believe that they presented a couple of years back at a uh, few years back at a DRC a conference. You see this is an enhancement mode device, you can see that the threshold voltage is 0 or more than 0, this is the output transfer characteristics, Okay, the leakage is low etc. What they have shown is that they have recessed the barrier. So, you see instead of algan gan hemp, they have used an indium aluminum nitride gan hemp. Why? Because indium aluminum nitride gives you higher 2 dg density, it gives you around 2 into 10 to the power 13. So, that higher current density is very good for low knee voltage point number 1. Point number 2 a higher charge density also gives you lower excess resistances which is also very good for your low power device because your excess resistance has to really come down. Okay. And thirdly you can have very thin layer of indium aluminum nitride few nanometer, so you can deeply scale them without any problem of a gate to channel aspect ratio that I talked about. So, they have used indium aluminum nitride, they have mentioned this as substrate, they have not mentioned if it is silicon carbide or silicon or any other substrate, Okay, we will keep it at that right now, we will come to that later, but they have etched the channel away or sorry they have etched the barrier away, the aluminum nitride is only on the excess region between gate and the drain and between gate and the source. In the below the gate they have removed the aluminum indium aluminum nitride, so that the 2D electron gas disappears, so that it becomes is normally off. Now, they put an oxide, that oxide is a high k dielectric, very interesting, high k dielectric is typically not good for high frequency, but they have used the high k dielectric because your gate length is so scale, this gate length is around 90 nanometer here. So, they are able to get cutoff frequency in the order of 150, 200 gigahertz even with high k dielectric because the gate length is only 90 nanometer and this is a thoroughly optimized and carefully developed high k dielectric that they are giving. Details are not discussed of course, it is industry, but it is a high k dielectric and the gate is sitting on top of the high k dielectric, there is a gate self aligned field plate is happening here you can see. So, it is a very interesting architecture because they have recessed, they have gate recessed it fully, the channel is fully recessed so that the 2 dg disappears below the gate, so that you get an enhancement mode operation. If the 2 dg disappears below the gate completely that means, it is normally off. You have to apply a positive voltage on the gate plus 1 volt or something to turn the channel on that is what they have done. This is a positive gate voltage, but again your gate voltage, your drain voltage everything swing has to be very low because it is a low power handheld device, handheld in a handheld gadget. Okay. So, this is your gate metal they have put. Now, contact resistance has to be really, really low. 
So what they have done is that they have removed the L indium aluminum nitride. They have also removed GAN in a way. Okay. They have removed GAN in a way. Okay, and they have done regrown. This is regrown. That means they after they etch away the channel and the barrier, they put the sample back into MOCVD reactor, MB reactor again, and then they grow extremely highly doped gallium nitride typically, so that the source and the drain will have a lower contact resistance. Okay, but instead of growing gallium nitride, they are growing indium gallium nitride because indium gallium nitride will have even lower band gap than gallium nitride, and lower the band gap, the better it is for contact resistance. So they are getting very good contact resistance. They are having excellent. Uh, conduct sheet resistance and that is why they have very low source and drain access resistances also. You do not need very high breakdown voltage, you need a breakdown voltage of 8 to 10 volt only and for such a low breakdown voltage in gallium nitride, you do not need care about gate drain spacing. So, you can have very very scale gate to drain spacing that is how you get very high FT and F max. Okay? So, they have used N plus ingan regrowth contact for lower ohmic resistance, they have used indium aluminum nitride barrier for higher sheet resistance and lower excess resistances, oh sorry higher sheet yeah, lower sheet resistance and hence lower excess source and drain excess resistances. Okay, they have not used probably a back barrier, but they may have used the back barrier, they are not revealing that here yet. But you can see that the on resistance which should be as low as possible, the on resistance has come down significantly with the use of high K dielectric as an enhancement mode gate device as opposed to a silicon. RF CMOS or RF SOI kind of a device compared to that gallium nitride high K which E mode operation gives you at least 3.6 times improvement in the on resistance which is impressive. They have also shown that with respect to gallium arsenide which is this the output power as a function of frequent uh, efficiency you can see the gallium nitride with high K dielectric as a recessed E mode enhancement mode gallium nitride has an improvement of 1.5 times in output power density as opposed to the state of the art gallium arsenide. It also have has 15 to 18 percent improvement in the efficiency as opposed to state of the art gallium arsenide. So, efficiency is also better and the output power density is also better which is a win win situation for gallium nitride. Okay. At a drain bias of 3.5 volt only at a frequency of only 2 gigahertz because it is a sub 6, sub 6 gigahertz mobile application. Okay. So, you can see that enhancement mode RF device in gallium nitride is picking traction. It has shown tremendous promise over state of the art gallium arsenide or silicon devices in terms of power, in terms of on resistance, in terms of efficiency. So, it, this is one of the important ways in which the area or the field will move ahead in the future. Okay? And that brings us to the question of gallium nitride RF, gallium nitride on silicon substrate. So, gallium nitride on silicon is a very big uh, topic for power switches 600 volt, 900 volt, even 200 volt power switching DC DC converter application, which is not a topic of this course. However, RF devices have been predominantly on silicon carbide for better quality of GAN epi crystal. But RF gallium nitride on silicon is also gaining a lot of traction, and a lot of groups and academic and inst industry are also interested in the same. Because if you can make RF gallium nitride devices on silicon, you will have low cost scalability and volume manufacturability because silicon wafers are much larger. Silicon carbide you can get up to 6 inch, but silicon wafers you can get 12 inch correct. 8 inch is already common GAN on silicon 8 inch, 12 inch already, already people are start, uh, producing. So, you can have huge volume manufacturability scalability, you can develop CMOS in compatible process and use the CMOS foundries to scale up the volume and that is a big game. Okay. And supply chain ecosystem is well, well established for CMOS fabs. So, you want to leverage that. So, Ganon silicon is a big thing here. Okay. It is a very big thing. What are the problems? All the problems that are there for Ganon silicon carbide also exist on Ganon silicon such as the need for silicon nitride passivation, improvement in contact resistance, iron dope buffer, people may use also carbon dope. However, there are two main problems that are unique to Ganon silicon which are not there with Ganon silicon carbide for RF the most important being being there is the substrate loss. Because when you grow gallium nitride on silicon the growth is different. You have to use an aluminum nitride nucleation, but on top of that you cannot grow GAN directly I will come to that quickly. So, this aluminum nitride nucleation that you grow on silicon even if you use a resistive high resistive silicon the interface will have inherently a parasitic channel kind of a thing. Okay? Uh, there is still ongoing studies, but there can be a lot of in diffusion out diffusion of impurities here, a lot of crystal defects here whatever be the reason you will have a substrate loss. What it means is that the 2D electron gas can capacitively couple to the substrate here 
the some capacitive coupling will happen and you will have huge RF loss. So, if you plot the RF loss and you can measure the RF loss experimentally using S parameter, we have not come to that yet. Using S parameter, you can do an RF measurement, RF loss measurement. If you plot that, typically the RF loss for ganon silicon is much higher than that of ganon silicon carbide, typically, which means your 2D electron gas is capacitively coupling to the substrate below or the I would rather say the interface with the substrate below, the interface channel, and that reduces the gain that in increases the loss, your cutoff frequency, your output power, everything is much lower. In fact, your current densities are kind of lower because of the fact that the crystal quality of ganon silicon is inferior to that of crystal quality of ganon silicon carbide. The dislocation density could be between 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 10 per centimeter square, 10 to 100 times more than that of sil ganon silicon carbide. So, reliability will suffer, the crystal, the structural quality will suffer, etc., etc. All of these tend to reduce the current okay, densities in general, but the RF substrate loss is the number one main culprit that will lead to a significant RF loss. There are many interesting papers and studies on this RF loss and also about this what kind of introduces this parasitic channel, okay, gallium out diffusion, in diffusion and all impurities being there, okay, the way you grow in aluminum nitride, everything matters actually. And so, the growth is a very, very critical aspect of this in order to minimize the RF loss. It has to be a careful and thorough, a comprehensive investigation and optimization of the aluminum nitride nucleation and subsequent layer growths to reduce the RF loss. The second important problem in ganon silicon is that because of a huge difference in the you know thermal expansion coefficient. When you grow it at high temperature, we bring it down to room temperature. The way GAN cools and the way silicon cools are very different at different rates. So, what happens is that the because of this mismatch, okay, the GAN wafer will develop a significant strain on the silicon wafer and it will bow. What does bow mean? The wafer will bend. Okay, the wafer will bend. So, wafer will bend like that, for instance. Okay, this is a wafer, this is silicon, on top of that you have grown GAN, so the wafer will bend like that. So, that bow is a very bad thing because when you do lithography, we want to process the entire 6 inch or 8 inch, you have an UV lamp here, correct, when you are using lithography, the distance of this part will be different from distance of this part from the lamp. So, what will happen is that your different gallium net or device features will not be uniformly exposed in lithography, so you will have a lithography problem. On the top of that, you have to put this on a chuck for lithographic exposure. If you have a bow or a bent substrate, uh, you, you, you it will crack if you try to planarize it with respect to the, uh, the plate form or the chuck below. So, bow is a significant problem. So, you have to manage the strain and so there is this Elgin transition layers that are done to manage the strain and also manage the dislocation to some extent. Without this strain management layer, your gallium nitrate layer is going to crack. But despite this Elgin transition layer, your wafer will still have some bow and this is a big problem. So, the bow which is which creates a headache for your processing process issues okay, and strain management and uh, RF substrate loss, these are some unique problems okay. and reliability is also a separate topic. People have not investigated reliability in such great details, although they have done it, but in general reliability is expected to be poorer because of a higher dislocation density, a poorer material quality for ganon silicon. But that being said, there is a lot of interest and lot of effort on ganon RF silicon electronics, especially for base station applications. So, this image taken from YOL, it shows the current market evolution in 2023-24, you know in that range. So, people are still using silicon LDMOS, LDMOS stands for lateral diffused metal oxide semiconductor and people are improving the performing performance because silicon has you know people squeeze out every juice, every drop of juice from silicon. So, silicon LDMOS is doing fantastic for 4G LT, but for 5G people are looking at gallium nitride on silicon carbide, especially for sub 6 gigahertz, 3, 4, 5 gigahertz application up to 7 gigahertz. That is where silicon carbide, ganon silicon carbide will be reigning supreme, but ganon silicon is coming from below and people expect that for 5G millimeter wave or even for higher frequencies at low power levels, ganon silicon could be a dominant technology in the future, maybe 5 to 7 years from now. This is this screenshot is just to show that people have gone much ahead. People have shown 10 watt power amplifier, 3 watt transmit receive module using ganon silicon RF process RF platform 100 nanometer gate in carbon. Carbon is basically around uh, carbon is around 28 to 40 gigahertz. So, people have done, people have reported MMICs, power amplifiers, low noise amplifiers in ganon silicon 
even up to 94 gigahertz people have done that there are commercial foundries such as omic which is absorbed by another company they offer foundry services for ganon silicon also for rf electronics so it's a rapidly maturing area it is not that immature it's very rapidly maturing area and people are expecting that in base station application especially with massive mimo there is something called massive mimo for beam forming for and you know it's it's a 5g antenna element you can say people are breaking down the power requirements into smaller smaller units so you have smaller smaller units which will need lower power say less than 10 watt. So, those kind of antenna elements with less than 10 power can be met by Ganon silicon. Ganon silicon may not be very promising for much larger power such as a radar or something, but for the smaller power segments Ganon silicon could be very promising and another very interesting aspect I already told you is Ganon silicon for mobile handset where you will need E mode RF hemmed and where you will need a very low low power RF hemp for gallium nitride where 3.5 volt is the bias not 28 volt or 50 volt which is typically used in gallium nitride power amplifier. So, that intel paper I had shown you would most likely use a silicon substrate or a substrate which is CMOS compatible. There are more engineered substrates available nowadays. Engineered substrates are substrates that are pro proprietary. So, they are not revealed in detail, but they could be some Poly, polycrystalline amorphous some combination of silicon some oxide some nit aluminum nitride etc which is cmos compatible in a fab and which can go to high temperature and you can have 6 inch 8 inch on which you can grow gallium nitride almost lattice matched or very close to lattice match so ganon silicon is a very promising so the paper by intel i had shown could be one of those substrates it's not revealed there but silicon is the most attractive substrate for using uh, you know ganon silicon enhancement mode low power RF for mobile handset that is a something that is probably few years 5 to 10 years from now that can be the market. So, this is the line that is coming up will hopefully catch up. The other line is for Ganon silicon for mobile base station telecom base station or uh, uh, the local tower in that also you need uh, you know power amplifiers and Ganon silicon could compete for them. So, reliability is an issue that has to be addressed. So, there is a lot of studies that will is coming up it will come up and scalability, scalability Ganon silicon RF 8 inch for instance has to be thoroughly you know demonstrated and matured and all these things ecosystems to be there. These are different companies that are available which can take up Ganon silicon for instance many of these companies are in, in the western world or in Japan for instance. Okay. Another interesting new thing for uh, gallium nitrate RF electronics as I told is to combine a power amplifier, a low noise amplifier, a switch at least on a single monolithic die. Okay, an MMIC, MMIC, a monolithic microwave indicated circuit. This is an image from a company called Corvo. It's all in the public domain. It's in their website. Okay, you can go and search for this part number, and Google will give you this details. So this is public domain information. They, this is a transmit receive module, TR module. Okay, it can transmit, it can receive at nine to ten point five gigahertz. Of course, the TR module, and there will be other things also, such as uh, maybe a mixer, an oscillator phase shifter, circulator, etc., which could be implemented on other materials such as uh, RF SOI or CMOS or something. But the basic transmit receive, you know, power amplifier, low noise amplifier switch are implemented in GAN and this is commercially available. Uh, again, there will be strategic and, and there will be import restriction, but it is there in the market. You see, there will be receiving, there will be receiving say, chain and then will be a transmitting chain. So, the receiving chain, the antenna will receive and feed the signal here and then all the processing will happen baseband etc etc then the signal will be transmitted there will be a power amplifier the power amplifier will boost the signal and the amplifier the antenna will transmit it here there will be a low noise amplifier the low noise amplifier the receiving signal will be very very weak and faint in magnitude you have to amplify it without amplifying noise as much so the low, low noise amplifier is very critical to amplify the very weak signal without compromising on the noise and so that is amplified and it goes to the chain gets all the processing done and then you transmit the signal you boost the signal power in the power amplifier and you send it out. So, this low noise amplifier power amplifier in the same thing and there is a switch here the switch will basically flip one side or the other in a way notionally you can say it will either it because it is on the same dyno. So, either you activate the transmit or uh, sorry the transmit chain or the receiver chain. So, the switch will flip between the two okay electrically to choose the receive or the transmit and so LNA switch and power amplifier should be on the same die for instance okay it not should be it is desirable to be on the same die because it will make it integrated solution. So, you can see the noise figure on the receiver chain is 2.7 dB pretty good I would say the small signal gain is 2.21 dB uh, the saturated power is 36 dBm. So, 36 dBm would be uh, more than 1 watt okay it is approaching uh, 10 watt. So, 40 dBm is 10 watt. Uh, and 30 dBm is 1 watt. So, it will be few watts of power. Large signal gain is 23 dB. 
when you say large signal the signal swing is very large small signal small signal you know you are you can linearize around that point. So, the large signal 23 dB power rate efficiency is 38 percent okay at 36 dBm okay. The package dimension is mentioned here uh, this is output this is the receiver chain Rx is receiver this is transmitter. So, receiver chain has an output power of 21 dBm which is slightly more than 0 0.1 watt. The transmit chain you have 36 dBm which would be a few watt okay. So, this is your uh, uh, I would say integrated RTR module on an MMIC on a single chip of gallium nitride. Uh, there is more details here maybe I can remove this annotation and you can see that uh, uh, it is a front end module application designed for X band radar application. This is Ganon silicon carbide by the way most likely most likely Ganon silicon carbide it is for radar. It has a TR switch a low noise amplifier a power amplifier receiver I already told you. Uh, it can go up to 4 watts of power. So, 36 dBm is 4 watts of power okay. It is fabricated on Corvo's 0.25 micron that is the gate length 0.25 micron Ganon silicon carbide process. So, it is silicon carbide. The package is uh, surface mount package air cavity there are different kinds of package of course okay and blah 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 and so it, this is the package dimension this is for X band phase there a radar application highly strategic will be most likely import restricted okay. But this is the kind of things that on the technology side gallium nitrate device technology is moving towards okay. Uh, the last thing uh, what is the next frontier for gallium nitride nitrogen polar. So, nitrogen polar is actually reverse polarity gallium nitride device. So, all the things that you have discussed until this point is gallium polar. If you flip the wafer upside down it becomes nitrogen polar which means the polarization is opposite. If you take a piece of gallium nitride which is nitrogen polar then the top will be positive and bottom will be negative which is opposite to what we have discussed so far. So, nitrogen polar has some unique advantages. For instance, because of the polarization being reverse because it is a it is a reverse polarity uh, thing you will have a it is this is the band diagram by the way you will have a 2D electron gas this is a 2D electron gas quantum well which is towards the top not towards the bottom in the in the L GAN GAN it goes like that no. If this is your top this 2D electron gas is here, but this is your top the 2D electron gas is facing towards the top not away from the channel to away from the top. So, what I mean is that there is an the way the band diagram works because of the reverse polarization this is your natural back barrier. What it means it confines this 2D electron gas it confines the 2D electron gas naturally okay. You can see this confines the nature the, the back the back barrier is inherent you do not have to design it separately. So, the back barrier confines the 2D electron gas better. So, you will have better confinement better GM and this part is a lower band gap material. Okay, as opposed to algan gan hemmed in a gallium polar conventional where the algan is the top where algan is a wider band gap. This is a lower band gap you can actually do an in gan graded also. So, overall the contact resistance is lower much lower for n polar because the top is a the top this top this top is a lower band gap. And so, you can get a in general and you can get a lower contact resistance for n polar as opposed to gallium polar ok. So, contact resistance is lower you can get very high GM because of better confinement better gate control ok uh, and natural back barrier that is and because you have a back barrier you will get very suppressed short channel effects. Your short channel effects like uh, dibble drain induced barrier lowering output conductance all these things will be lower because of a natural back barrier. You will not allow the carrier to be spilled over you will not area substrate will not allow substrate injection to happen. So, this is a typical stack I will not go through the stack details in general, but this is a typical stack and there is quantum capacitance. What does quantum capacitance means? When you go for super high frequency this is for millimeter wave like W band 94 gigahertz W band super high frequencies. When you go to such high frequencies your gate length will be very very narrow scale down your gate to channel also will be very narrow. So, when you have gate to channel you know you have a gate length which is suppose 60 nanometer which means your gate to channel distance you know if you this is your gate if you consider a typical algan gan hemp or ALN gan hemp this cannot be more than 6 nanometer ok it is cannot be more than 6 nanometer and because it cannot be more than 6 nanometer what happens is that uh, this 2D electron gas has a spread delta D there is a spread. The spread of the 2D electron gas actually contributes to another capacitance called quantum capacitance. We have ignored that always because the thickness of the channel is typically 20 25 nanometer around 25 nanometer and the spread of this is around 3 nanometer. So, because of this 3 nanometer spread of the electron 2D electron gas in algan gan hemp and the barrier being around 25 nanometer we ignore that. But this quantum capacitance becomes very dominant when you have an algan barrier or an LN barrier of only few nanometer for millimeter wave application. Now, what happens is that in gallium polar you have an algan or ALN 
and then you have 2 dg. So, this is suppose 6 nanometer and this is suppose 3 nanometer. So, the to get to channel distance is actually 9 nanometer, but in an this is conventional conventional gallium polar, but in an n polar ham your top will be GAN and the bottom will be ALGAN. Okay. This is and a 2D electron gas is on the top here top interface like the towards the gate towards this is the gate towards the gate it will be not away from the gate. So, if the GAN thickness is suppose 6 nanometer and the 2D electron gas spread is suppose 3 nanometer then the gate to 2D electron gas spacing is only 3 nanometer. So, because the gate has come even closer to the 2D electron gas, so the quantum capacitance is actually acting in favor of your device operation. You will get very good GM okay? and so you are going to get high frequency advantages and because the top is gallium nitrate cap, your uh, passivation effects are better. Your current collapse is also reduced as compared to gallium polar hem. Because of all of these advantages, people have shown excellent work. So, here you have plotted efficiency, here you have plotted output power density in watt per mm at all 94 gigahertz close to 94 gigahertz which is really high. So, n polar has given this kind of values different generations of n polar devices whereas, conventional gallium polar devices will be here. The power added efficiency is low the output power density is also low you get around 2 to 3 watt per millimeter at an efficiency of 20 to 30 percent in gallium polar in n polar you get 6 to 10 watt per millimeter at an efficiency of 40 to 50 percent. So, that is an incredible imp improvement even if you look at this where they are plotting the output power versus the drain voltage. See your n polar device gives you higher output power 6 to 8 watt per millimeter at a drain bias of around 10 to 15 volt. For gallium polar you have to go to 20 volt much higher drain bias and then even then you get less than 2 watt per millimeter. Okay. So, this is a significant advantage of n polar over gallium polar as far as millimeter wave or such w band v band electronics is concerned. So, this is another frontier of RF electronics in the near future. Okay. So, with that we will conclude the lecture here today uh, lecture 33. We have one more lecture to go and in that lecture we will talk about linearity, okay. but today we discussed about many of the uh, uh, things of gallium nitrate RF devices where the, where the future of this device might uh, this technology might lead, what are the new device architecture, what are the new concepts that are being adopted is what we discussed today. Okay. So, thank you for your time I will see you in the next class which is the last lecture of this week on gallium nitrate RF devices. Thank you.